Let's pray. Father, as we come today, as we sing about your character, we sing the fact that you are immortal, and that you are the only wise God, we, we pray today that you would help us to meditate on your works so that we see you as you are. There are so many messages from our own hearts, so many messages from the accuser, so many messages from the world around us that wants to cloud who you are, that wants to cover that up so that we do not see it, so that we do not think about it. We pray today that we would see and think clearly about who you are. And we pray that the songs that we sing, that the word that is preached, uh, that the conversations that we have would point us to who you really are, Lord, so that we, from one generation to the next, tell each other of the goodness of God and the greatness of God and the wisdom of God, the fact that you are good to all, that you are compassionate and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. We pray, Lord, that those uh, would be the messages that we, we hear from one another, that we would hear in our service, that we would begin to see in all of the world around us. Instead of seeing and hearing messages of fear and of, um, of worry, of despair, instead, Lord, we pray that we would become a people convinced of the goodness and the character of God and his goodness to us, his provision for us. Today we pray for one of our church plant supports down in Lebanon. They are preparing to gather for the first time next week. And so we pray for Jacob and his wife Mackenzie. Lord, we pray your blessing on them this week. We pray for the people that are a part of their uh, church that are helping to start it. We pray for the college students there in that town that need the chance to hear the good news of the gospel. We pray, Lord, that you would use our partnership in the gospel with them so that people get to hear and experience the good news of Jesus the way people have heard it through our church for over 180 years. We pray, Lord, that that new beginning in Lebanon would be next week. And so we ask for your care for them and all of those things. God, I pray for those that are in our church today that come with heavy hearts, whether it's worry or fear or despair and depression, whether it's the things that have happened or the things that may happen. God, I pray your comfort on the people in our church. God, I pray for those in our church who need physical healing. I pray that you would show yourself the, the great physician, just as you did when you walked the earth. I pray that you would show yourself kind and compassionate and good in these ways. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In our breakfast nook, on top of the microwave, I have two cactus. And uh, I, I got those from my wife's grandma. And she got, these are cuttings that she got from a uh, cactus that, she, that uh, she got from her mother and her mother-in-law 50 and 60 years before she gave them to me. So by this point, they're about 55 and 65 years old, or they're from cactus that were at least that old. So I don't know how far back it goes. So she gave them to me, and then she said, uh, either she or a family member, when they gave them to me, they said, just water these as often as it rains in Arizona. And I was like, I don't know Arizona weather at all. So I was like, it m maybe it never rains in Arizona. Well, evidently, the, the climate in Arizona must be horrible, because I don't think you could be mistreated as badly as I've mistreated these cactus, and they're still doing fine. So they have been dropped, they've been knocked over, they've had all sorts of things happen. So, uh, my, somebody in the family then got their own cuttings, and they said, how do you take care of this? And I was like, well, if you water it often, it really grows, but then you've got the problem of what do I do with a growing cactus? And so if you water them once a month or so, then you end up being just okay, and it stays a good size. And so I've had it for five or six years now, and it's, it's doing just fine. But these cactus, they basically just, they were planted in some, some sand, get very little water, and they do just fine being ignored. But I've got other plants that if I treated them like the cactus, they'd be long gone. We've got some okra that if I, it's six or seven feet tall now, but if I fed it even how the way I fed my tomato plants, the okra is going to not produce what it, it should because all of the different plants need something different. You guys know whether you keep a garden or whether your job is farming, like one kind of plant needs this kind of care, whether it's extra water or less water, whether it's if you grow flowers, some flowers need fertilizer, but then other flowers, if they get fertilizer, get too tall, they flop over and they do no good. 
And I was thinking of that, the fact that plants need different kinds of things for them to grow. Because as we gather here on a Sunday morning, we all have different ideas maybe in our head of like, what is it that God would give the church to help the church grow? We could probably come up with a list of things that we would go, well, if we just work hard, then that'll be the thing. Or if we have this kind of activity or this kind of program, if we have this kind of a leader or this kind of a preacher or this kind of a Bible study. We, we each of us come here on Sunday morning, we have preferences, maybe traditions, or other kinds of methods where we think, well, this is going to be the thing that's going to give life to the church. But like the plants that I was mentioning earlier, there are actually some kinds of activity, some kinds of things that will actually kill the church and some things that will actually give life to it. Today, as we start our new series, Walking Through the Book of Philippians, we're going to be looking to see what God says gives life to the church. What God says is the thing that will build the church. Just in the very first, the very first two verses. So go ahead and turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Today we're going to be looking at verses 1 and 2, which could be verses that you just kind of toss to the side. I'm sure that when you guys get a, a letter or a note, you don't like obsess over the envelope. You don't like look at it and go, can you believe what it says right here? You, maybe you like the, the stamps, but you don't obsess over the, the way that it's addressed. And yet, when we look at Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we end up finding that God, using Paul, transforms what's a normal this is a letter from Paul to the church in to become something that lets us know this is what gives life to God's church. And we see it in the very first two verses of Philippians. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow along on the screen with us. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, as we open your word, help us see in these simple two verses what it is that gives life to the church and help us go there together. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It comes to us and tells us, look to Christ who builds his church. He uses these first two verses to say, look to Christ who builds the church. We may come with all of our own theories about what it is that's going to do that. Activities, programs, outreaches, methods, Bible studies, prayers, all sorts of things. But Paul uses Philippians to do something amazing and tell us the themes of this letter. You, you saw in the video I introduced it a little bit last week as I talked about this series. But Philippians isn't a problem book because Philippians is written to a group of Christians that Paul loves dearly. Philippi is a city that's what we would now consider northeastern Greece, which means very little to me or you or anybody. Like we don't really know the regions of Greece, but nor the northeastern part of Greece. So it's almost the very edge of Europe. And Philippi was a, a, a city where Veterans from the Roman army would often retire to this town. And Paul, on his missionary journeys, this is the, this is the part where, if you remember the, the term, the Macedonian call, where an angel comes to him in a dream, calling him to go to Macedonia. Well, he ends up in Philippi. And he meets there. There's no church. There's no Christians there. But he goes and he meets a woman who sells, a rich woman who sells cloth and shares the gospel and she becomes a Christian. And then he sets a girl who tells fortunes because she's, she's indwelt with a demon, with a spirit. He, he sets her free. Gets, Paul gets thrown into prison. And then when he's freed from his prison and the jailer is going to kill himself, he shares the gospel with the jailer. And so then the jailer and his whole household become Christians. And so Philippi is a church in a Roman colony filled with, Ro with Roman soldiers, or former Roman soldiers, founded on a rich purple uh, uh, cloth cellar, a little girl who's set free from a demon, 
and a jailer who had been about to commit suicide because he, he, he had failed at his job but instead became a Christian. And this becomes one of Paul's favorite churches. And he writes to them not saying, you guys are so messed up like the Corinthians. He doesn't write to them like the Galatians and say, you guys have abandoned the gospel. He doesn't write to them like Timothy, who, and he says, Timothy, here's my advice for you. This is what I want you to do. He's not writing to them like he does to the church in Thessalon- Thessalonica, where they're new believers and he needs to set them on the right path. He writes to the Philippians, and he starts telling them that he loves them, and he starts telling them whatever is on his heart and whatever is on his heart for them. And so what I want to show you today is in these first two verses, Paul really sets up the themes of everything in his letter by telling them, look to Christ who builds his church. And what I want to show you today here in these verses is four ways that looking to Christ builds God's church. The first way that we see from this passage is look to Christ who gives you your identity. Look at verse 1. When Paul describes himself, he says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Then when he turns to talk to the people that he's writing to, he describes them as, your translation will say, either God's holy people or saints. To the saints in Christ Jesus. The defining factor in Paul's life and in the church's life is that they get their identity because they come from Jesus. Ten times in the book of Philippians, Paul uses the phrase, in Christ Jesus. There are a lot of other times where he implies or uses some other way of talking about it. Because the thing that sets up everything about Paul's ministry and about the Philippians' life in Christ is that they get their identity because they are in Christ. Which means that if we are God's people, then our identity doesn't come from the place that we live, the family that we've been born into, the things that have happened to us, or the things that we've done, or the things that we've not done. It's that if we are in Christ, then the truest thing is that we get our identity from Jesus. This idea of union with Christ, like the, all, which means, uh, according to Wayne Grudem, all the ben- we receive every benefit of salvation because we have been joined to Jesus. That's what Paul wants them to know. Paul, when he's writing this letter, is in prison, and it seems that he was in prison in Rome at the time, but Paul is in prison, but he doesn't start out saying, like, look what's happened to me. Look at where I am. Paul is like, no matter where I'm at, whether I'm in a Roman prison, or I'm having a productive ministry, or whether I'm being shipwrecked, whether I'm being thrown in jail, whether I'm being beaten and left for dead, the truest thing about Paul's life is that he gets his identity from Jesus. That Timothy gets his identity from Jesus. And then that the Philippians get their identity from Jesus. That that little girl doesn't get her identity from what she used to be, but it's from the fact that she is in Christ Jesus in equal standing with Paul and Timothy and everybody else. The the jailer doesn't get his identity from the fact that he once served the Romans and was about to take his own life. It's that his identity comes because he is in Christ. And so this, the the very beginning of these verses calls to us to look to Christ for our identity and say, my relationship with Jesus defines my life and my death. It is going to be the thing that I want to carry with me moment by moment. I don't want the the image in my mind is what I've earned or what other people think about me. I don't want the the truest thing in my life to be the, the family that I was born into, the mistakes that I've made. I want the relationship that I have with Jesus to be the defining characteristic of my life so that when I think of my identity, it's not tall or short, rich or poor, successful or unsuccessful. It's that I, because I am in Christ, am a son of the King and get every benefit that he has earned. That Paul's going to pick that up later again when in the book of, later in the book of Philippians in chapter 3 when he, he starts telling the people, I, I could find my identity in all of these things. But Paul says, I consider them all worthless that I may gain Christ. In verse, Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, he says, and what, to, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, 
but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Paul says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul says, this is the defining thing of my life. It's not how good I was at obeying God. It wasn't the fact that I was a persecutor of Christians and once helped put them to death. That my identity is I am found in Christ. And so Paul uses the very beginning of Philippians to call all of us to look to Christ for our identity. Whether you're young or old, it is so easy to find an identity in something around us. Sometimes it's finding an identity in a temptation that we face and we feel like we can't beat it. We can never get away from that temptation, and so we're constantly beaten up and thinking, this is who I am. And yet Paul says, no, if you're in Christ Jesus, you have a different identity. You are saints of Christ Jesus. You are servants of Christ Jesus. Paul says, everything in your life is bound up by being in Christ. So don't look to your reputation. Don't look to your wealth. Don't look to your accomplishments. Don't look to your failures. Don't look to the past Look to Jesus for your identity. He calls Manchester Baptist Church to say that it is not our present, the possible future, or something in our past that defines who we are. The thing that defines who Manchester Baptist Church is we are a people in Christ. We are saints, not because we've been good, not because we've been successful, not because we have a long history, but because Jesus has a long history and Jesus has a future. And so our identity comes from we're a church made by Jesus Christ and kept by Jesus Christ. That's the first way that looking to Christ builds God's church. The second way this passage teaches us is it says, look to Christ who transforms your service. Notice, the, notice something else about how Peter introduces this letter. Peter describes himself... As a ser- your translation could say a servant or as a slave. Peter, Paul, Paul's an apostle. Paul has seen Jesus. Paul has been leading churches and planting churches, and he has been a missionary, and he has suffered, and he has led, and he, Paul has done all sorts of things, but notice what he says about himself. A slave of Christ Jesus. Paul defines himself as a slave, but then notice what he says to the church. He says, to the overseers and deacons. Paul does not take a title that he has just earned, but he makes sure to give honor away. Paul has, is not, has not taken the time, which he sometimes does, and says, I am an apostle of Christ Jesus. Here he says, I am simply a servant. Some of you have great titles like overseer and deacon. And so he takes the time to honor the, the leaders in the church. And what Paul is doing here at the beginning of this letter is modeling for us the life of humility and service in the church. That nobody is above taking the lowest place and honoring those around them. You see, this Paul making sure at the beginning to honor other people, to not compete with them, to bless them for what God is doing in their lives and in their ministry is a model for God's people. This is going to be carried in the rest of the letter, but Paul does it right here at the beginning. That's why I, this, the introduction is not something that we just throw away as an envelope that doesn't mean something. Paul is saying that, that Christ Jesus transforms service so that those who could expect honor and demand honor don't have to have it. Paul is teaching us, I think, that a measure of our maturity is being okay with giving away honor. That nobody is above service. All of us are just glad to be included. And so Paul is telling us, like, measure your own maturity by saying, am I willing to honor other people and making sure that they get the respect that they deserve without demanding that I get it too. This is going to be picked up in Philippians, especially when, when Paul is t- calling on the church to a life of humility. Philippians chapter 2 is one of the most famous passages in the Bible that says, don't look to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. And Paul uses the introduction to start doing that, saying, there are overseers and deacons. Let, let me make sure to acknowledge and bless and honor them. Matthew, I, this makes me think of Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 and 26, that, where Jesus talks about the temptation to demand honor. 
Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 and 26, he says, Jesus says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Right here at the beginning of this letter, Paul is, God is calling to us through Paul to say, look to Christ who transforms service to be a normal part of the church's life. This is the normal part of a Christian's life is to say, if I am in Christ, then I am okay with blessing and giving away honor and looking towards other people's interests. It, it means that he's calling husbands to say, the world around us says that Fathers and husbands demand honor. And Jesus says, not so among you. Those that want honor should be servants in their homes. It means that those in the church that say, but I have so much to give and so much to do. Yes, you do. But all of us should say, I want to be like Jesus and I want to be like Paul to make sure that everybody else gets the honor. You see, when we look to Christ, we find that Jesus is the source of a new way. The world does not understand why somebody might take the lowest place. Why somebody might say, it's okay, I'm going to serve. I don't, I don't mind cleaning up. I don't mind picking up. I don't mind doing invisible things. I don't mind, but let me make sure that those that get, need honor and deserve honor get it. The world does not understand that. But Jesus is the source of a new way that is not threatened by service. It's not threatened by humility. And so when we look to Christ, we see a Christ who transforms service to become good news for the church. So instead of jostling for first place, we're instead encouraging others to go first. The third way this passage teaches us to, that looking to Christ builds the church. The third way is look to Christ who creates the church's unity. Look at the end of verse 1. the end of verse 1, he says, to all God's holy people, or to all the saints in Christ Jesus in Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. We could just kind of pass over that, but Paul does not normally need to address a letter to everybody. He'll say to the church in, in whatever the town. He'll say to the church in Galatia. He'll say to the church in Thessalonica. He'll just say that. He does not normally need to say to all, but that's because there had started to be division in the church in Philippi. This church that he loved, this church that was his, one of his favorites, this church where he didn't have this major occasion where he had to try and fix something, but he knows that there's started to become a division. We'll see it later in the book of Philippians when he starts naming names and he's pleading with people to be unified. But throughout the letter, Paul is calling the church to look to Christ for the church's unity. Because, and he says, he's not, he says this, this term, the, to the, all the saints, together with the overseers and deacons, is because he wants them to know, I'm not taking a side here. The, the, the church of God doesn't have sides. And that Jesus become, is the source of the unity of the church. We will see that it's not unity at any price. There are reasons in Paul's other letters and there are reasons in the Philippians to, to sometimes divide. But the default position of the church should be that Jesus died to make us one. And so we're going to do our best to be one too. And we're going to look to Christ. And we're going to value and pursue unity much more than we naturally would do. Paul uses this introduction to all the saints to say that disunity is the world's default method. Let's divide, let's separate, let's make sure that everybody has to be towing the line and they're on our team and they do our way. But God's way is, no, that if you are in Christ, then he is making us one. And so we are not going to divide what Jesus has joined together. John chapter 17 is where Jesus prays for that, in, for his church. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23, Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, 
that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Notice that Jesus says the watching world will judge whether Jesus came from God based on whether the church will be unified. The watching world will make a judgment about Jesus based on whether we can love each other. And so Peter, or I'm sorry, Paul here in the book of Philippians is saying, guys, look to Jesus who creates unity in the church. Don't be so willing to divide. Do all that you can to live at peace with one another in the gospel. And so he calls to us to do the same thing. He calls to us to say, there are some things that we can overlook in each other. There are other things that we can do where we have to go and say, hey, this is wrong or this has hurt me or is this what you meant? Because unity is worth it if the world gets to judge whether Jesus came from God based on how Manchester Baptist Church lives with each other. If Scott County and Greene County and Morgan County get to make judgments about Jesus based on our unity with each other, then we have to look to Christ. Then we have to look to Christ so that He can create something we cannot create on our own. And so the third way of look, that looking to Christ builds the church is we look to Christ who creates the church's unity. And then the fourth way that looking to Christ builds the church. Look to Christ who gives the church blessing. Look at verse 2. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Letters at the, from the time of the writing of the New Testament usually had these three elements. It would be the person sending, the person receiving, and then it would say greetings. But Paul takes each one of those elements, and you can see he starts stuffing things in them. He, and here he takes what they would normally say, which is greetings, and turns it into the word grace. He takes the word that is normally just greetings, and he brings along the Hebrew word for peace, and says, I don't just want to say hello or greetings. He says, I want to say Grace to you from a God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I don't just want to say hello, but I want to remind all of us that every good thing that we have comes from Christ Jesus. Jesus, uh, Jesus is what transforms simple greetings into grace that overflows. Jesus is what transforms Paul's just normal, hey, I, I wanted to reach out and I wanted to say dear friend, and instead he turns it into This is where the church's blessing comes from. Grace for the church and peace in the church come from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think what Paul is getting at is that what he wants for the life of the Philippians comes from Jesus. Every good thing that Paul wants for the Philippians is going to come from Jesus. And so he says grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls to us and says that every good thing that we want in life doesn't come from a good marriage. It doesn't come from a good job or the right kind of education. It doesn't come from the right size of a bank account or a retirement account. That every good thing in our lives comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But I think it it then demands of us, do you believe this? Do you actually believe that grace and peace come from the Lord Jesus Christ? Or do we just downgrade grace and peace to greetings? And the reason I ask, do we actually believe this, is because I think that if we actually believe that grace and peace come from the Lord Jesus Christ, then it shows up in our prayers. If we actually thought that grace and peace came from Jesus, then I would pray a lot more than I actually do, right? If I actually thought that the grace and peace that my kids needed for the rest of their lives was real, it would show up in my prayers for my kids. If if you actually believed that grace and peace came from Jesus, 
then whoever else is sitting on your row, it would show up in your prayers for them. If we actually thought that grace and peace came from the Lord Jesus, then the, the kids that play in the park or the kids that get picked up by the school bus and dropped off every day across the street from us, we would be praying, God, you're the source of grace and peace, and so we're going to pray regularly for those kids. If we actually thought that Jesus was the source of the blessing that our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers needed, then we would end up, it would show up in how we prayed. A few years ago, well, actually, it's not a few years ago. That's when I feel like I'm 13. A long time ago, uh, there was a time where there was a, there was a cake, and I don't know how the cake lasted in our house that long. When you've got a lot of kids, cakes don't usually make it through one meal. But there was a chocolate cake, and we came down the next morning, and some of it was missing. And my mom was doing some investigating and asking, who ate the cake? And everyone's like, I didn't eat the cake. And like, I, I can't lie. Like, it's like really hard for me to lie. It's kind of written all over my face. And so I, I definitely didn't eat it. And at that point, I probably would have just fessed up because I was in college and you can kind of get away with it at that point. But uh, so my mom's going around trying to figure out who ate the cake. And everybody denied very seriously eating the cake. And the, tr- the reality is we believed everybody. But the problem was one of my brothers had chocolate cake in his mouth. It's like all in his mouth. And so, like, after, like, but he seriously denied eating the cake. Like, he was dead serious, not manipulating Ma, not manipulating us all. He was, like, as far as he was concerned, he was telling the truth. I didn't eat that cake. Uh, And it, it turns out he was one of the brothers that would sleepwalk. And it seemed that he actually was sleep eating that night, which turns out that's a disorder some people have. Well, and because he was denying, he's like, I seriously, I don't know why there is cake in my mouth, but I didn't eat it. And besides, like I was asleep the whole time. What is the deal? And so I was thinking of that story because like the proof of the missing cake was in his mouth. We just had to figure out how and why. Are you lying or are you telling the truth? Do you have an issue right now? And we need to start locking up the food in the middle of the night because the proof was in his mouth. I was thinking of that story because if we believe that Jesus is the source of grace and peace, then the proof is in our prayers. Will we actually pray for each other? Will we take seriously the opportunity to pray for our friends and our neighbors? Will we say, God, you didn't put us at 404 East Street on accident and have people who drive past our church, whether it's to pay a bill or to pick up the mail or it's to go from home to work, but you put us right here and so we are going to pray for the people that pass our building and our sign We're going to pray for the families that pick up and drop off their kids. God, we're going to pray for the people that live in front of our house and behind our house and next door to our house because we actually think you're the source of blessing that they need. If we we actually believe that Jesus is the source of blessing, then we begin to take seriously our Sunday school classes are not just places for us to go and study the Bible a little bit, take a few prayer requests, but it's actually a place for us to take seriously, God, you are the source of blessing for the people in my class. And so I want to pray. The reason I say that if we actually believe this is because I think that if we actually believe it, then it shows up in how we act. Sometimes, if you're like me, we just begin to go, well, let me just try to pretend my way into it being real right? We think, well, if I, if I just, well, let me just put it on my to-do list to pray some more. But what I think God is actually calling us from this passage is to actually believe that grace and truth come from him because then the prayers will start to take care of themselves. We begin to seek the Lord and say, God, I want to believe that you are the source of grace and peace in my life and the source of grace and peace for my kids. And you're the source of grace and peace for my spouse or for my parents or for my extended family or for my coworkers. And God, give me the belief that shows up with fruit in my life. It's not calling us to staple on the fruit of prayer. Actually, to, to, to go to the source, look to Christ Jesus So then that shows up in how we pray for each other. This passage calls to us and says, look to Christ who builds God's church. 
It is this, these two simple verses where he says, look to Christ, look to Christ. Every good thing comes from Christ. Christ is what makes you who you are. He's the one that transforms service from humiliation to honor. It's a good place to be, to serve. Jesus is the one who can take people that are divided and make one out of them so that the world looks and says, only Jesus could do something like that. But maybe you hear these words and you are crushed by this. Maybe here today, you see this identity uh, that comes from Christ Jesus, but you found your identity in people, in money, or in accomplishments. Maybe you see this idea of service, and you see how how you fall short of God's standard. Maybe you see unity, and you realize, I have so many broken relationships. Where do I start? Maybe you see this idea of blessing, and you realize realize that your prayer life does not prove it. Look to Jesus right now. If you have repented of your sin and trusted in Jesus to save you, look to him again. He brought you in with his identity and his humility and his sacrifice so you can trust him to bring you home. Look to Christ and let him transform you from the inside out. Look to Christ and believe the power of the Holy Spirit that uses the gospel to produce fruit in you that you have never been able to do on your own. But maybe you've never looked to Christ. Maybe you realize right now that you stand on your own before God and you carry a burden that is crushing you. The Bible says that you have rebelled against God's authority and you have rejected his law. The Bible calls that sin and tells us that the penalty for sin is death. That is the weight that you carry today and every day. The Bible starts with this bad news. But the good news of Jesus is that instead of leaving you there, Jesus, who is both God and man, came and lived the perfect life, died the death in the place of sinners like you, and then was raised to life so that he can offer his life, death, and resurrection for you, who repent of your sins and trust in him alone to save you. Repent means to change the mind and turn away from sin and rebellion against God. Trusting in Jesus alone to save you means not trusting that God will just overlook, or that you've been good enough, or that you've done good things, or that you've been baptized, or that you've been a church member. It means to trust that God accepts Jesus' life and death in your place. If that is you, please come and talk with me today. You can come and talk with me at any, at any point during the week, but I want to help you understand this and point you to Jesus for salvation and see that Jesus is the one who makes a new life. He's the one who builds the church. He's the one who builds Christians. So this passage says, look to Christ who builds the church. I want you to imagine with me what changes in your life when your identity is rock solid because it's maybe a saint, definitely a slave, but it's in Christ Jesus. Imagine when what happens at home or what happens at work is not the truest thing about you. It's an identity that's rock solid. It doesn't come from your temptation or from your victory. It comes from Jesus. Imagine what happens in a home where one person looks to Christ who transforms service so that instead of keeping score about who did what, who's forgiven the most, who's worked the hardest, it becomes a place where, hey, I can take a spot because Jesus transforms service. Imagine what happens in a church where the unity does not come because we agree with each other or even simply because we like each other, but because we look to Christ and we love him and he has made us into a church that loves each other. Imagine what happens in a community when, there's, when we begin to see that grace and peace are flowing to our friends and our neighbors, when it's flowing through us and through our church and through the churches in our town and in our county and in our state. That sounds like good news. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you invite us to do the one thing I feel capable of doing, which is looking to Jesus. Lord, I can't transform my service. I can't staple on fruit in my own life. I can't staple on fruit in our church. But Lord, we can look to Jesus. And we thank you that that is what you call your church to do. And we pray that you would help us to do that. Lord, we pray that we would see you as the source of grace and peace in our lives and in the lives of every person that is living around us. In Jesus' name, amen.